By the summer of 1944, American tank crews had a problem you could measure in yards. German Panthers and Tigers were hitting hard at long range. The 75mm, 76mm, and 3-inch guns couldn't reliably deal with those big cats at typical engagement distances. Standard Shermans could still win, through numbers, flanking, and teamwork, but the margin for error was shrinking. The U.S. needed a way to punch back at distance, and fast. Designing a brand new heavy tank would take too long. Tooling, testing, training, shipping, none of that fits into a 1944 calendar. So American planners took a different path. Don't build a new tank, build a new gun platform. Mount more firepower on a chassis you already know how to produce, ship, maintain, and drive. That decision produced a machine with an unglamorous name and a very clear purpose. The M36 tank destroyer. To understand why the M36 existed, you have to start with doctrine. U.S. tank destroyer units were never meant to be breakthrough tanks. The field manual emphasized speed, maneuver, and ambush. Get to the threat axis, hit enemy armor from the flank or at standoff, then relocate. Early in the war, the M10 with its 3-inch gun fit that idea well. But as 1943 turned into 1944, the battlefield changed. Panthers were showing up in numbers. Engagement ranges stretched. Reports from Europe kept asking for more gun, especially something that could threaten heavy German armor beyond close quarters. The answer was sitting on drawing boards already, the 90mm M3 gun, originally tied to the Pershing program. It offered the ballistic performance crews were asking for, especially with improved ammunition. The 90mm M3 was a long-barreled, rifled gun designed for armored fighting vehicles. With standard armor-piercing ammunition, muzzle velocities typically sat in the 800-850 meter per second range. With specialized high-velocity rounds, they went higher, flattening trajectory and improving energy on target. The gun brought a couple of things crews cared about, stability and accuracy at useful ranges, and room for powerful AP and HE shells. The question was how to get that gun to the front now, not in a year. The solution was classic wartime pragmatism, reuse existing chassis. Initial M36 production used M10A1 tank destroyer hulls. Later, to get more guns to the front faster, the U.S. Army fitted M36 turrets to M4A3 Sherman hulls. On top went a new, larger, open-top turret, light enough for the chassis, spacious enough for the 90mm. That open turret wasn't an accident or a shortcut. It was a trade-off. Keeping the roof off saved weight and lowered the center of gravity. It gave crews visibility and kept the big gun workable without turning the vehicle into a top-heavy mule. The cost was obvious. Exposure to shrapnel, snipers, and airburst. But in tank destroyer terms, hit from standoff then move the trade made sense. Firepower isn't just caliber. It's the ammunition you feed the barrel. The 90mm M3 fired APAPC rounds that were already respectable, but the game changer was HVAP, a tungsten cord high velocity shot that dramatically improved penetration at range. Crews didn't always have much of it. Tungsten supply was tight, but when HVAP was on board, the 90mm could do things a 75 or 76mm Sherman simply couldn't, especially against the Panthers' tougher angles. Even with standard APC, the 90mm gave American units confidence to engage sooner and farther. In practical terms, standard APC from the 90mm M3 gave American crews credible penetration against Tiger One's near-vertical frontal armor at normal combat distances, and consistent results against Panthers when you aimed at turret fronts, mantlets, and side plates. HVAP extended those envelopes, opening more frontal opportunities and pushing effective ranges outward. You still needed good shot placement and you still respected slope, but the 90s best ammo let you take shots a 75 would rarely try. 
From decision to delivery, the timeline was quick. By early autumn 1944, U.S. tank destroyer battalions were re-equipping with M36, sometimes mid-campaign. Crews familiar with Sherman family systems found the transition manageable. Same style suspensions, transmissions, tools, and many common spares. That continuity mattered. A weapon is only as good as the support that keeps it running at the front. The M36 first major tests came almost immediately. In December 1944, during the Ardennes Offensive, M36 were thrown into defensive lines and roadblocks to blunt German armor. After action reports described typical engagement bands of 800 to 1,200 yards against Panthers and other targets. Frontal kills were possible under the right conditions, especially with HVAP, but doctrine still favored angles and ambush. What changed was the comfort zone. An M36 could take shots a regular Sherman would hesitate to try. Weeks later came Raymogen, and the M36 found another role, long-range counter-armor fire supporting a bridgehead. Accounts from units on the west bank of the Rhine describe M36 engaging heavy German vehicles at over a thousand yards, immobilizing or detonating them before they could close on the bridge. The headlines didn't say new tank, they said the quiet part that mattered. The gun did the job. Panther superiority didn't vanish with the M36. Armor still mattered and that sloped glassy stayed a hard problem, especially at range with standard rounds. But the M36 changed the calculus. It let American units dictate more engagements, set ambushes with a gun that could finish the job from farther out, or punish exposed Panthers trying to relocate. In the tank destroyer role, fast response, standoff, shoot and scoot, that was exactly what was needed in late 1944. The bigger story is logistics. Because the M36 used existing chassis, depots already had the parts, mechanics already knew the systems, and crews could be trained now, not after a year of conversion. In a war where supply lines were the difference between pushing and pausing, that mattered as much as armor thickness. There were drawbacks and crews knew them. The open top demanded discipline under artillery and in towns. Side armor wasn't going to stop serious anti-tank weapons. Against a dug-in pack gun, the M36 wanted smoke, flanking, or infantry support just like the M10 before it. But when the enemy's heavy armor appeared at range, the M36 delivered the one capability the field had been asking for, a reliable, mobile platform for the 90mm. Adding a turret and a gun, rather than replacing an entire vehicle fleet, meant firepower arrived in time to matter in late 1944. And when the gun reached combat, the ammunition family made it flexible. HE for general support, APC for most armored work, HVAP when you needed a fast, decisive answer. The result was not a super tank. It was something better for the moment. A weapon system that let US units regain initiative, engaging heavy German armor on terms closer to their doctrine, at ranges they could live with. The stopgap stayed. The M36 kept serving after 1945, Korea, and with several allies for decades, because the underlying idea was sound. Marry a potent gun to a chassis the system can absorb at scale. It isn't a grand story. It's a wartime solution. That's why the M36 existed. Not because it was the strongest tank or the newest, but because it was the fastest path to the right firepower. In 1944, the US didn't need a revolution. It needed a weapon crews could field immediately. One that could reach out, hit hard, and then move. The M36 was that weapon. A stopgap on paper, a big cat killer in practice, when and where it counted. <laughs>